I am pleased to welcome you all for the last session of the day, for which I am personally very excited because, as far as I have experienced, there is a sense of difficulty that women face in legal field. The session will be taken by Ms. Sonal Vattu, ma'am, who will be speaking on careers in non-court fields like prevention of sexual harassment. Ma'am is a lawyer with over 25 years of post-qualification work experience. She holds a DLLB Honours degree from the National University of India, Bangalore. Ma'am specializes in compliance relating to Work, relating to workplace harassment and diversity issues. She supports various clients as an independent ombudsperson handling employee complaints via the internal dispute redressal mechanism and as an independent IC member for the prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace issues. She will be speaking about exploring careers in the niche field of law like prevention, uh, prevention of sexual harassment at workplace. Uh, please give a huge round of applause for Ma'am. To this with any kind of boredom. Uh, my colleagues before me spoke a lot about three things, patience, perseverance and passion. Right? And that's, that's really what they don't teach you in law school, but they teach you what my colleagues have really asked you to concentrate on is be patient with your career. Uh, you know, persevere, keep working hard and follow your passion and it will come through. So I'm actually going to talk to you about my personal story because my career is built completely on what they did not teach me in law school. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. My father, he's no longer alive, was probably the biggest feminist that I have ever come across. A great believer in pushing women to work, a great believer in education and a great believer in letting you take responsibility for your actions. So I always grew up with this understanding that go out, do your stuff, but if you mess up, you clean it up. You don't come back to me and say clean it up. And when you grow up in that environment, you start to take things seriously. You don't be frivolous in your decisions and your actions. And I chose to go to law school. I did not apply to any other uh, college. National Law School at that time was a shed. Uh, there was nothing known about that campus. We had heard very brief, you know, there's some five-year program that started. And uh, I applied for it. I applied nowhere else. And my entire career has been based on the fact that I have never had a plan B. I have only had a plan A and that plan A has been to do what it is that I intended to do. Should I put this off? Okay, is this better? Okay. So, um, I will put down a few points to talk to you and, you know, tell you what they don't teach in law school. But I'm actually going to walk you through uh, what my personal journey has been so that you understand it. I never knew after law school what I wanted to do. Like many of you are talking about litigation and this is what we want to do. My story is exactly the opposite. I knew what I did not want to do. I knew I never wanted to sit behind a table. I knew that I have a, beyond three months things start to bore me. I cannot do work beyond three months on the same subject. Uh, civil law would put me to sleep in law school. I failed a paper on um, intellectual property, which should give you an indication of my intellectual capacity. Uh, my sister was getting married and I was more interested in you know, attending that ceremony. I failed the paper. I came back, I was as disinterested, I failed the paper again and my professor very kindly said, I really think you need to study and you know, clear this one paper. It was the only paper I ever failed. But just to tell you, I mean, I think he was just kind and he pushed me through. In all likelihood, I would have probably failed it the third time as well. And I'm telling you that because it's okay to be imperfect, okay? You don't have to come out the first in college. You don't have to come out winning. You don't have to come out um, in a competition that makes you unhappy. You have to come out so confident and secure that whatever you have is what's going to take you further in your career. 
So I knew definitely what I did not want to do. And uh, in one of the things that I knew that I wanted to do was I wanted to give back in some form or the other. And while we all talk about giving back to society and joining an NGO, I will tell you, I've run an NGO, Helping Hands is the name of my NGO. I've run it now for the last 23 years plus. I set it up when my son was newly born and I thought that this is something that I, I wanted to now formalize. You can only give back when you yourself are secure. When you are not secure, these are very idealistic conversations, give back to society, give your time to society. You can do that when you yourself are secure, but work in an NGO because it makes you very grateful for what you have. And you don't then take for granted the things that you have. Be it the opportunities, be it the choices, and that's why we always say do your first internship with an NGO. But I started, I, you know, I was doing criminal litigation and then I decided, you know, this is an NGO that I want to set up. I trained as a forensic investigator, by the way, interestingly. I've never used that part of my career in India. Uh, but I trained as a forensic investigator, came and then I set up this organization called Helping Hands. And when I set it up, my father, and he's been a very big influence, and the reason I will mention him is because you will find in your lives that person that influences you. And they will actually teach you a lot more than what this curriculum will teach you. So my dad told me, in India, only crooks set up NGOs. And it's a way for them to siphon money and make money. And you know, you get funds, you don't deliver, that money goes into your coffers. So I said, okay, how do I set up my NGO? So I set up a self-funded NGO. So I actually sat down and I said, this is what I want to do. Law school teaches you to be productive. Law school does not teach you to be creative. Okay, and, and that's the very big difference. So I said, I'm a lawyer. I have this skill set. I've trained as an investigator. What is it that I can do? And while I was thinking of, you know, of course, we were doing the regular matrimonial abuse, we were doing child abuse, which was just, there was no law in our country. By chance, I happened to meet somebody who was part of the labor department in the U.S. government. And um, the reason I got to meet her was because I loved attending conferences or any seminars that were organized in the area of how women were being given better opportunities, be it entrepreneurial opportunities, be it, you know, more policies that were being created to make them secure. And by chance, I met this lady and she started to talk to me about sexual harassment. I came back and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do in my NGO. There was no law on sexual harassment in our country. It was never heard of. But I put together through research, and research is going to be your best friend. I researched and I put together what sexual harassment was conceptually per international labor convention, definitions, policies, what the US government was looking at. And I went from company to company in India telling them, you must put a policy on sexual harassment. And the kind of responses that I got was, Hamare company mein sex vex nahi hota, we don't need a sexual harassment prevention policy. Or I had people tell me, Samjaye ye kya hota hai? And I would say, Aap haat nahi laga sakte hai, Aap galat tarikhe se baat nahi kar sakte hai, Aap ashleel message nahi bheg sakte hai. And they were like, Hum bheg bhi nahi sakte hai. And I said, Nahi, Aap galat tarikhe se bheg nahi sakte hai. And I had a very senior HR person tell me, Agar hum dekh bhi nahi sakte, to hum fir women ko apne company mein kyun lai? So that's the time that I started my career where I was on this drive to push that you need to treat women with respect at the workplace. And then lo and behold came the Vishaka judgment in 1997 that set six guidelines in place. And nobody knew about it, you know, it was just one of those, ha, hai, you know, paper mein dala hai, no one really knows about it. But I set out making these decks, uh, by the way, we didn't have laptops at that time, just to share with you, uh, we had overhead projectors.
so we would make slides on these transparencies and we had to carry bulbs with us because wherever we went to a client site to make these presentations because they were long and lengthy, their machine would get hot and the bulb would burst. So I'm just trying to explain to you how technology was not our friend and hard work was our friend. So what I learned through that journey that I did not learn in law school was it's okay to be different. It's okay not to do what everyone else is doing. It's okay to not earn as much as your colleagues are earning. But my theory was, I want to get up every morning and do this work. The day I wake up and I say I'm not enjoying it, I then need to come to these gentlemen and say, can you offer me a job? Okay, I'm in the same position as you. As a lawyer today, I know only two laws. But you wake me up in my sleep and I will narrate the most minute detail and aspect and interpretation of that law to you. These two laws are prevention of sexual harassment and POCSO in reference to children. Ask me about the constitution of India. I know what I learnt in law school. Ask me about the IPC or ask me about corporate law. I know what I learnt in law school. But I made it my mission that if this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it so well that I will have every answer that could probably come up in that scenario. And for me, a very big game changer was, you know, the way corporate India looks at NGOs is, there's a stereotype. There's this woman who will come wearing fab India kurtas with kajal in her eyes coming all the way down to her cheeks. She's going to be wearing big silver jewelry and carrying a jola and she's going to come and say women, women, women and basically mess the heads of every man in that room because you come with this extreme hatred towards the male species. And in all honesty, I am pro-women. I am not anti-men. My agenda was never to come into an organization and say men are crap and women are superior. My agenda was to go in and say treat them the way you treat everybody else. And treat them a little better because they are in the minority numbers currently in your organization and continue to be. So treat them better. And many organizations didn't want to meet with me because I was a woman and I was running an NGO. So the stereotype was we invite her to our company, we're inviting trouble. And that's still, uh, oddly enough, a narrative in our country. The game changer for me, and Satyakam said this, that if you have the intention to work, the work will find you. And I'm, I'm giving you a true story. There's a very, very big law firm in India called AZP. You've heard of it? Ajay Behel, Zia and Behram are the people who set it up, Ajay Behel, and then of course it's, it was Ajay Behel, then became Zia. And it's, it's a very successful law firm. And AZP called and said, listen, we know you do the sexual harassment stuff, and we've got this really big case, but we don't know what it is, can you take it over? And I was just, I said, of course I'll take it over. And I did that entire case for them and closed it and they said, hand us your bill. And so the process is that AZB paid me and AZB billed the client. So I raised a bill of 15,000 for that case, end to end, for conducting the investigation and taking out the report. And AZB sent me a check for 30,000, exactly double of what I had uh, raised my voice for and I went back um, you know I their accountant was a Kashmiri and uh, you know apparently he's never cleared a bill as fast as he's cleared mine because he read my surname and he said Are, here's another Kashmiri so I went back and I called him and I said look you've made a mistake my invoice was for 15,000 you've paid me 30 and he said, hold on, I'll have to put you, you know, in touch with the partner. And I called the partner and they said, do you know what we bill the client for your work? It would not be right if we paid you 15 because we bill the client into four for the work that you did. 
and that's what your worth is. And what I'm trying to tell you is that till today, I actually struggle with asking for money. So what I have got sorted is I've got someone else now to do that part of asking for the money. I don't do it myself. Sometimes clients call me and say, don't you want the money? And I'm so focused on the work that there are times honestly where I forget the money. But what blesses me is that my clients pay irrespective of whether I raise my voices or not. And they do that because I will work 24 by 7. I will work through Christmas if need be. I will work through illness, but I will make sure that I am there closing out that case. And for somebody who asked about work-life balance and you know how women need to take time out because of maternity and things like that, yes you do because it's a biological need for you to rest. No other reason. There is a need for you to rest after you deliver a baby but I will also give you the honest truth. My son grew up perfectly fine without me. Okay. My fear is if I had been around him more, maybe he would have turned out to be a complete wacko kid. <laughs> I am not a traditional mother because I made my choices. I am not a mother who does brush your teeth, have your bath, have you eaten food because I felt that he will do that. And I needed to use my time to engage with him in a quality manner. Do I regret my choices? Not at all. Do I feel guilty? Initially I did. Every time I travelled and I travelled 20 days of the month, I would come back with a gift for him. Till a point I realised that my son wasn't waiting for me to come back home, he was waiting for that suitcase to open and that in, in my son's time it was a little wrestler, WWE or F, or I don't know what that wrestler little figure was and he was waiting for that and he has the whole collection now. Half my salary went into buying those ridiculous figures, but that was my guilt. And um, your work-life balance is what you want and what you think is important. And yes, family time is important, but I chose to give time where I knew that my engagement with my son was quality rather than quantity. Okay? We are remote control parents. Um, you know, I can't do a case remote control, but I can solve a problem at my home remote control. And these are personal choices that I've made with absolutely no regret. But let me also share with you what my choices have brought before me. I've taken a path of a career that is very confrontationalist. You know what I mean? You're conducting an inquiry against somebody who is a perpetrator of sexual harassment. In all likelihood, this is an extremely powerful person. This is a person whose career and reputation is at stake. And you have to work with integrity without coming under the pressure of who this individual is. You've just got to put your blinkers on and focus on what has taken place. It doesn't matter whether the complainant was a housekeeping staff working in a hotel room and my respondent in the matter was a state guest who touched her inappropriately. For me, the fact that he is a state guest and she is a housekeeping staff are irrelevant. My focus is on the incident that's happened. So there have been some times in our careers where we've been threatened. There has been time where our client has provided us with police protection through the inquiry. There are times where people have tapped our phones and followed us in an attempt to intimidate us. And I think you don't stop doing the right thing because of these roadblocks and impediments. You move on because you know that what you are doing is correct. And I think that strength of conviction comes from the fact that you don't compromise with your values. On the flip side, I conducted an inquiry and I can't really talk about these matters because, you know, I sign a, a very thick confidentiality agreement with my clients, but a lot of these cases are out in the media. I conducted an inquiry against one of the most highly decorated paid 
officers of a very large organization in India that led to his separation from that company as a consequence of that sexual harassment investigation. Post that, he was asked to leave the organization and I was coincidentally called to their office to do a closure, a year-ending closure on all the matters that I had handled. And he was sitting in his room and I actually knocked and I went in and I said, I've just come to wish you and I know that you're moving out and I just want to wish you well. And he said, will you have dinner with me tonight? And I said, yes, absolutely I will. And I had dinner with him and he said, you know, this was the most eye-opening experience because never in your interactions, even for a moment, did you make me feel small or make me feel like crap. It was a conversation that was clinical. It was a conversation that called out the facts. It was a conversation that narrated the law and explained to me, irrespective of what my intent was, my actions had a very negative impact on somebody and I need to take responsibility for those actions. And I come back on days like this and I say, what is my measure of success? And my personal measure of success, and please disregard what Shonjoy said, I don't want Shonjoy way too long. It's not that, you know, there's this big house and this big car. My measure of success is that I don't compete with anybody else. Because I don't know other people who do this law. Who do I compete with? I, um, my measure of success is, was the quality of my report better? Was the quality of my conversation better? Was my preparation better? And was my research so strong that when my client received the report, there was no doubt in their mind for what action they needed to take. And that's my that is my personal measure of success. My measure of success is not, can I buy a bigger car? Can I buy myself more jewelry? Can I buy myself a branded bag? Can I do X, Y, Z? I have personally never measured my success with my bank balance. Don't make the mistake of doing that. You're going to lose out on many, many, many other experiences if that is your only measure in life. But what they don't teach you in law school is to become thick-skinned. And as a lawyer, you need to be so thick-skinned. In one of my first appearances in court, I was arguing for interim bail for a gentleman who was in Tihar for murder. And he came to me and said, my daughter is getting married, can you apply for bail for me? And I applied bail for him during vacation court because my senior was not available at that time. And the judge opened it and then he asked the I.O. and the I.O. came up to him and whispered something in his ear. The judge picked up that file and threw it at my face. And I just started crying. I, I, I never had a more humiliating experience in my life. And I just started crying and you know, I think he got scared because one, he didn't know whether I was crying out of humiliation or physical injury because that fire came flying at my face. Uh, it, it was, I just wanted the ground to open up. I didn't want to turn around because I didn't want people to recognize me and for the weeks thereafter say, hey, this is the one who received that flying file in her face. You know, I was so embarrassed. And um, Pinky Anand, very famous lawyer, she was just coincidentally in court and uh, after she consoled me and said, look, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, she said, come, let's go meet the judge. And I stood outside and she went in, spoke to him and then came out, called me and I went in with her. And when I saw him, I just started sobbing all over again because I just, I was like, God, my career's finished before it's even started. And he said, how much research did you do on this file? And I said, your lordship, I went, I met him, he gave me the wedding card, I gave it to the court, I prepared the brief myself, you know, whatever it is that I, I could do. And he said, do you know his daughter is five years old? His daughter is not of marriageable age. Did you go and check in his locality? Did you ask around and see what you were getting yourself into? 
And I said, no, I didn't. He said, you will never forget that file in your face. And honest to God, for many reasons, I have not forgotten that file in my face. It hit me really hard. It didn't just hit my face, it hit my heart. So, you know, for the sake of being dramatic, I will tell you that I took sick leave from my senior because I wanted this to fade away from public memory before I made my next appearance in court. But it taught me to be someone that paid attention to detail because the trick is in the detail. Okay, pay attention to every spelling error. Pay attention to punctuation. Pay attention to things you don't think are important and relevant because that shows your caliber and diligence. Law school doesn't teach you that. Secondly, pay attention to competing with yourself, not with your colleague. Thirdly, pay attention to grooming yourself. And when you groom yourself, groom yourself in your communication skills. Groom yourself in the way that you look. And I'm not talking to you about being fancy and getting your hair done. I'm saying a pure professional. Groom yourself in how you conduct yourself. Never go for a meeting without a book and a pen, not pen and paper. A book and a pen that you constantly write things down in. Don't rely on your gadgets and your phones and your laptops. But please make sure that you follow your heart. Don't leave your brain behind, okay? Carry that along with you, but follow your heart. You follow your heart. You may do something that law school didn't even design for you, but you will do something related to the profession that will get you success. They say in life you need to do three things. And the three things you need to do is, whatever you do, one should work towards being creative in your life. Whatever you do, one thing should be something you're passionate about and something that creates or, or brings creativity. The second is do something that makes you mentally and physically fit. And the third is do something that makes your bank balance really strong. Because when your bank balance is strong, you are in a better position to give back. And that should be your aim. You give back, you will get tenfold back. And keep that as a steady aim for yourself. Give back in whatever way you can. Be it doing free cases, be it helping people, be it giving time to an NGO, in whichever way you want to talk about it. But here's the reason that I chose this specific line of prevention of sexual harassment. I chose it because someone pointed out, right, about women being in the minority and how there is this, I mean, Sean Joy spoke about it so candidly, that it is still a boys club and you are pushing your way into it. It doesn't mean that you don't, just push harder and push stronger. But the reason I got into it was because I saw that women were ready to settle for less. You were ready to settle for lesser salaries. You were ready to settle for an environment that was disrespectful for whatever reasons. And if you stay quiet, what you actually do is you contribute to that hostility and you contribute to that toxic behavior. Our laws are very strong now. You're going to go out and work in law firms tomorrow. Somebody said, ma'am, you know, in independent practices, there's a lot of sexual harassment. And I corrected her to tell her there's a lot of sexual harassment in any industry. Judiciary, I train judges on how to do cases of Foxo and Porsche. I am amazed in the lunch break they come and say, if we are victims of sexual harassment, who do we talk to? These are empowered women that you and I look up to and they are victims of sexual harassment. There are people in our own fraternity who are victims of sexual harassment. There are people in the film industry and you saw that in the Me Too movement. There are victims of sexual harassment. There is no, this is what a victim looks like. It could be you, it could be me, it could be anybody. Do three things. Number one, don't participate in it. 
shut it right there and then. Number two, distance yourself from that individual. If you know somebody is interested in you, the person has expressed interest, you have said I am not interested, do not hang out with that person. You are giving mixed signals. Distance yourself from that individual. And number three, speak about it to somebody else. Every policy in our country right now will bend over backwards to make sure that women are safe, women are not victimized, your confidentiality is not compromised, and you do not face any form of retaliation. Take advantage of this law. Because if educated people like you choose to stay silent, in a few years you have contributed to that problem. And we saw that, right, with very, very renowned journalists. To the men in this room, you understand three things. Number one, you can be victims of sexual harassment. Number two, take a no for a no. Okay? If you tell somebody you're interested in them and you'd like to have a cup of coffee with them to get to know them better and they say no and you ask them a second time, you will probably have coffee with somebody like me. Okay? <laughs> and the third data point is that you could be victims of sexual harassment. Which is why when we work in this area, we push for gender neutral policies. We are not protecting women, we are protecting human beings. A man who is a victim of sexual harassment is as much in trauma as a woman. This is not a law to protect women, this is a law to protect people. Okay? So do remember when you go out into organizations, and you face sexual harassment, don't stay quiet either because gender stereotypes are that men are these strong individuals who don't face harassment. You might, I hope you don't, but if you do, always know that there is a platform for you to speak to somebody with. And I think for both, it's never the intent, it is always the impact. It doesn't matter whether your intent was I was joking, or your intent was it was just, you know, immaturity, we assess impact. And if the impact is that your behavior has made somebody uncomfortable, that's what we go after. Okay? So in a nutshell, what they didn't teach you in law school is have the courage to do something different. Have the courage to take time if you are confused and you don't know what you want to do. But use that time to very clearly eliminate to say, this I definitely don't want to do, this I definitely don't want to do, your choices then get clearer and narrower. Concentrate on building your own personal profile and concentrate on building your own personal personality. It starts with grooming, it goes all the way to your communication skills, it goes to how good a colleague you are, you should have a relationship where you can pick up the phone and call your biggest competitor at work and say, look, I'm stuck, I don't know, can you help me? Because to say, I don't know and I'm sorry are the two greatest qualities of strength that you can ever have. Okay? It's perfectly fine not to know. But have the courage to say, I don't know. I call my colleagues all the time. They could be judges. They could be senior counsels like those sitting before you. And I always say, I don't know, can you tell me this? And when they do, I study, 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 I learn, learn, learn. Because my focus is very simple in life. This is what I want to do and this is what I'm going to do. I don't know anything else. I don't claim to know anything else. If you ask me about constitution, merger and acquisition, labor laws, I know nothing. Ask me about sexual harassment at the workplace, ask me about POXO, I will be able to tell you everything because I've made it my professional mission to know everything. And yet, every case that I do, I learn more and more and more. So be an open learner, be willing to take feedback and criticism, be open to improving your skill sets every day 
there is no age that we stop learning, there is only a mindset that stops us from learning. Okay? So to summarize, sometimes I think law school doesn't teach you how to have fun. Okay? Uh, you don't have to get out of law school and hit the ground running. Okay? That's not what you are expected to do. Enjoy your time. Okay? Uh, keep a focus. Give yourself a month off if you need to. It's okay if you don't make the campus placement. Keep your contacts alive, network and be relevant on social media, not irrelevant. Do you know the difference? Irrelevant is I'm posing in Lavanya and selfie in a bathroom mirror. Okay, that's lovely but it's irrelevant for you now in the next stage of your career. Relevant is start to research, start to write, get out there and make yourself heard and be seen. Okay? I have no further gap to give you. I have no judgments to quote. I have no sections to give you. But I can honestly tell you that law school gave me, bless you, thanks, the habit of drinking black coffee, which is terrible. But law school gave me the most amazing set of probably the most high competent professionals that I can ever come across. I am in awe of the professional competency that my colleagues have. I celebrate their success and I know that they're a phone call away if I ever get stuck in my own professional dealings. And those are the relationships that you need to nurture in these five years. Okay? So good luck, stay well, uh, research, read, dance, enjoy yourself, have fun, don't get into trouble, don't create trouble and don't stay shut. If we are educating a generation of women to tolerate rubbish, we have failed miserably. Okay? So good luck to you. Their questions have been because you can't move forward. You try harder and you push, okay? That, to me, like I mentioned, there was no plan B. This is what I wanted to do. I was lucky that I, I had my dad and family support. Professionally, I, like I told you, I made challenge after challenge after challenge. Uh, I wasn't earning money. I was just doing, you know, little, little, little here, there, bail here, something there, something there file in my face like I told you, okay? So the fact is that you don't give up. And I think that conviction, nobody will give you, only yourself can. My father backing me up professionally could have also meant that, you know, 
I just did anything because I knew everything would be okay. So you make your own choices. As far as committees and organizations go, I have been very privileged in these 26 years to work with organizations that actually gave me a free hand to do the right thing. I have never settled a matter unless the complainant has in writing requested for the matter to be settled through a conciliatory process and that is not, that is not settling. That is, you give the person an opportunity to take responsibility for their actions and to give an apology. Companies probably will do that, but if they are doing it, it's wrong. And this is, look, I look at the Me Too movement. None of the cases that came up were cases that happened yesterday or day before. The cases were 9 years, 7 years, 16 years, and I'll share with you, 80% of those cases were organizations that I support. And we asked those women, why didn't you raise a complaint to us? We've been there for you. And they said, you know, we saw this lady complain against X person. No action was taken and we kept quiet. But see, seven years later, the dam burst, right? They did come out with whatever they wanted to. So the more you suppress, eventually the dam will break. And then what happened during the Me Too movement, companies were scrambling for protection because they knew they had failed the process and their systems. So it catches up with you. Somewhere or the other it catches up with you. I'm not talking law of karma. I'm just saying that tolerance is like that, right? You just, when you lose it, you lose it. Then it doesn't matter whether you're writing on Twitter or Facebook or, you know, you're screaming from the roof, rooftops. When there's trauma, you will scream. So I, companies who do that are asking for trouble and the Me Too movement will come back stronger. Give it another five, ten years, it will come back much stronger. Okay? Look, but I'll give you a flip side. There are cases that we do that we know are absolutely false, malicious, fictitious, nasty pieces of work because you want to get back at an individual and people think this is a great way to get back at them. And when we take action against the complainant in those cases, then we also face the backlash. But then you have to face up to it because that's the right decision you're taking. So to both your points, in terms of settling it as well as using this as a mechanism to, you know, like for personal vendetta, both will backfire at some point in time. So hang in there. Work harder and break those barriers and get out. Yes, please. But the back story behind it, like when I was interning uh, at the office, and I've, I've gone through the various cases like murder and everything. But the moment I was stuck with a rape case or a harassment case, something like that, in the night, I was not comforting. I was feeling things like, okay, God, how could it go like this? How could someone do this or that? I, it never happened to me even how ever the case was, how ever the murder was done and everything, the heart was taken out and it never hit it. But such cases does hit you, such cases does make you feel horrible. How to deal with that trauma and how do you deal with this trauma when you are only in this? So I think over a period of time you become clinical about it, not that you lose empathy, but at a point you shut shop and you come home. I think the cases that constantly stay with you are the POPSO cases where there's a two month old child that's been raped. You know, these are senseless cases. You, you just don't know what these are. Those cases do stay with you. But look, I think you need to understand that you need a lot more going on in your life. Right? There has to be a time where I come and I just completely cut off from work. You know, be it if I like exercising or if I want to go out or if I want to party, I'm not going to carry that with me and you do need to give yourself that relaxation and that privilege to cut off. By the way, murder cases or cases that they, my colleagues do are more or less traumatic. Okay? Rape is jarring and you know, you will come back with like really deep thoughts on that. Poxo is the worst. But you, you know, it's, a, it's not like I, I'm not doing a POPSO case because it doesn't leave me and I keep thinking about it. You've just got to cope stronger and better when you do this kind of work.
Yes, ma'am, please. Sorry, 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 there was a lady behind you. She was waiting, so I'll take her question then yours. Thank you. Ma'am, it is not a question, it's just a concern which disappoints me a lot at times. Because uh, the men are so much accustomed to the authority that they may violate a woman and they won't even realize it that they did it. And it takes a lot of courage for a woman to come out and speak that she has been violated. And it's never It's only a section of society which is much aware of the sexual harassment and we as lawyers are reading it, we know our rights and then we can speak about it. But there is a section of society who shuts the scenarios off. So, ma'am, what do you like? So, first things first. My discussion and my language is never that men violate women, it is some men violate some women. I think I have the strongest support system in my male colleagues and my male friends. I am very comfortable with them. And I think as women you actually get a sixth sense. You know many of the victims I speak with and counsel tell me I had a bad feeling, I just couldn't put my finger on it. And I'm going to tell you that your sixth sense is actually going to give, give you that opportunity of keeping a distance. Men violating is known. It is not that, you know, we, we don't know this. And our discussions have always been about keeping women safe. I think that women of my generation are now talking to their boys about how they need to behave. And I think that's where the story needs to change. I can't keep looking at this boy in my house like, you know, the sun shines out of him and expect that anything he does, I will cover up. And I think the buck stops there at home. You need to teach your boys to be respectful. Even in a fight, they need to use the right language. Anybody who talks with their hands, boy or girl, it's not that women are not aggressive and violent, they are. Anybody who talks with their hands needs to be dealt with in the same manner. But honestly, I do believe that people are recognizing it and there is change coming about. I have seen more reporting now than I have ever seen before. And I think it speaks a lot for the comfort that women have to know that there is a machinery that is working to take care of me. Otherwise, you wouldn't report it out. So I see a change. Honestly, if you asked me 26 years ago, I would draw a really dark, bleak, pathetic situation. Now, I'm fairly confident that God forbid somebody touches any of you in a public transport system, you will get together and clobber that guy. Don't do too much damage, do little damage. But it's not like you're going to, you know, like stand in a corner shivering and not knowing what to do. You will beat him up because you know that people will also support you in doing so. So take advantage of the times that you're in now. Speak up. The more you speak up, it threatens people, they stay quiet. Ma'am, you are aware of this recent case where this judicial officer was accused of sexual harassment and that video is being very much viral on Twitter as well. So ma'am, uh, people who are in power do that and they get away. You know right, sexual harassment has nothing to do with sexual appeal. You never choose a victim basis what they look like. I am not a perpetrator who is going to say, oh so sexy, I am going to harass her. Never. You are going to look at somebody and you are going to say, this person is in such a vulnerable position that she is not going to talk. And I do that because I have the authority over that person's job to say that you talk and I am going to mess your job up. So, Sexual harassment is nothing to do with sex, last appeal. It is everything to do with misuse of power and position and authority. So yes, 80% of cases come to us from power equations. Okay, so it happens. <coughs> to me, talking about it and educating people is the only way to make a change. There is no other way. And taking really harsh action, like to your friend's point, not settling the matter, but putting it out as an example to say, I don't care if you're a dignitary, I don't care if you're a judge, I don't care if you're a politician, I don't care if you're a movie star, you do this and there are consequences for your behavior. And that's the way the law needs to look at it. Okay? 
Stay safe. Thanks. Please. Uh, as we have seen recently, the most controversial case of sexual harassment, I mean, from the corridors of Supreme Court, uh, Justice Gogoi's case, how far do you see uh, the idea of sexual harassment has unfolded since then? And do you see any kind of change in your client's behavior after such controversial case, after, like, especially when there is no conviction for this? I see men scared, which is not a bad thing, okay? Uh, a little bit of fear makes you a little cautious. It's not a bad thing. But I think what... Uh, so that case, by the way, was very jarring for us as lawyers. And we were part of signing a petition to say, follow process. You have laid down the process for us, just follow your own process. We don't know the truth, right? There's one version and another version and a third version and stuff floating around in this university or WhatsApp, that's the most dangerous. But at least follow the process that you expect us to follow as lawyers and that was our appeal. But I think what I see is that companies now recognize that reputation damage is beyond, that there's no monetizing or that it's, it's way beyond saying, 10 million or 20 million or 500 million reputation loss, you don't recover from it. Okay, you, you look at, you, they say, you know, memory fades and people forget, nobody forgets. There uh, are people, uh, yeah. yeah, by the way, there are people like lawyers will tell you as a girl, avoid this one's office or don't join this one. Because we wouldn't put our daughters in those offices. Why would we recommend someone else's daughter to work? So, you know, those we, we understand what you say. But I think the good thing is um, people are scared. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that little bit of fear. There is a follow-up question. Uh, do you think uh, it is more difficult for women to take up cases of sexual harassment cases, especially when there is greater inequality? Firstly, women in a law field and that to fighting for the prevention of sexual harassment. Well, I don't know what else to do in my career. So my answer to that is no. I don't know any other law. I have very limited intelligence. And this is the law that I know. I have never struggled with it. I have never struggled. I'm not saying that as a woman I have an advantage. As a hard-working lawyer, I have learned everything and I continue to learn. I never sleep without reading about developments in the area of sexual harassment around the world. My Google alert is sexual assault, sexual harassment, box, or sexual abuse. Somebody will wonder what the hell it is that I do, but this is my Google alert. And the time that I get is when I'm finished with work, and that night, just before I sleep, an hour I dedicate to reading this, then I shut off and I do some other stuff. But keep yourself updated, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It matters how well read and thorough you are in that photo. A woman can do anything that a man can and I think probably better because we do it with more grace. So just do what you want to. young boys being sexually abused from known people. Yeah, that's, that you that's know, 70% of a perpetrator in a POXO matter is a family member, somebody close to the family, a neighbor, a grocery store that you frequent, a driver, a school person. So it's a known person and boys are uh, as impacted if not worse than, than little girls. So yes, to your point. Yes, so uh, with this particular thing, 
people are especially boys are not comfortable because society has not made them comfortable talking about all these aspects particularly still if you confront them that have you ever gone through all those aspects they will not say yes to it because society has not made them uh, comfortable with that particularly so how to go ahead with this because we are going to be boys and we need to handle all these aspects we are when, not talking about it when you have children don't make stupid statements like boys don't cry Don't make these gender stereotype statements. When your daughter is getting married, don't say, "Tumne khana banana sikha ki nahi." Talk about things like, "Have you learned to save?" You know, talk about life lessons, not "roti banana" and stop crying. These are just stereotypes that we carry through to our children, and we create that that kind of. You know, boys are brave. Boys are strong. Boys don't talk. If a boy is crying, he's sissy. Rubbish. Tears is an expression of sorrow. Maybe there are some women who don't cry. There's nothing. Uh, you know, stop crying like a girl. We only create these rubbish stereotypes. But yes, I think boys need to be cajoled more into sharing of these things particularly young boys because you know right through they made to feel like i am the warrior and i am the protector of everyone in this family but i think we need to change that narrative now thanks thank you yes please i think we need to wrap up yeah. yes please Certainly, certainly. So a big round of applause for Ma'am.